Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. From life on a farm in rural Australia, where wide open spaces made a young woman yearn to know what was beyond her country town. She moved to the city, became a mother, and found her dream career, which took her across the world. But still, something was missing. In her search for love, she traveled far, trusted deeply. She wanted so badly to find someone that she almost lost herself in the process and learned some hard lessons along the way. Fool Me Twice, a new memoir by Jules Hannaford. Available August 20th on Amazon. Today I'm here with Kevin Wong. Hi, Kevin. Thank you so much for meeting me today. Yes, thank you for having me. Kevin, you are an entrepreneur, you have your own startup, and you've invented the Ori Ring. Tell me a little bit about the ring and how you discovered it. Sure, yes. We created a very weird little ring called Ori. It's the world's first voice assistant ring. You can sort of see it right now on my finger. That's so cool. So for our listeners, it's like a very chunky ring that is on Kevin's forefinger, and it's all black and very sort of slick, and it's got a little box on the top. Yeah, so what this ring does is It's able to allow us to do some private communication and private interaction with voice assistance. It sends sound as a physical vibration that passes through your finger directly into your ear when you touch your ear. So only you as a single user can hear. It has a microphone that picks up your voice, some smart software in the ring that allows you to take voice commands, do translation. It will read out text messages. It will talk to you and things like that. Really? Yeah. So you're using bone conductivity? Yes, correct, yes. What exactly is that? Is that sending messages through the bone? There's a software and a physical element to it. So the engineering element is we have magnetic-based actuator that sends sound as a physical vibration that is able to pass through any physical medium. So some people call it bone conduction. But uh, and it can pass through a table, through a metal object. I guess the famous instance is how Beethoven used to listen to his piano through a metal rod. Right, so of course. And that same way vibration can pass through a solid object. In this case, it's your finger. And then when you touch your finger to your ear, then a lot of that vibration is then passed through your ear canal as well as the bone structure in your ear directly into your head. Essentially, it's like having a little telephone in your ring, or is it more than that? It's like having a little computer in your ring. Yes, that's right. It's an interesting concept. It's more like having Alexa or uh, smart speaker-based products out there right now. Do you mean like Siri? Yeah, like okay. Siri or like HomePod or Echo from Amazon or from Google Home. These are all smart speaker products that you can use conversation to talk to them and interact with them. And Ori is a similar product, but more portable, private, and something that you can use on the go. So I think we typically, we call this uh, screen-free technology. And we were initially inspired by my dad. My dad is a VI, so he's uh, visually impaired since 13. And it's been always difficult for him to use these touch-based devices. So we wanted to build something that allowed us to use today's very powerful electronic products from communication to translation to scheduling and all these multi-utility devices in a way that relied more on conversation and voice and audio. Is it really popular with the visually impaired now that you've created it? And what was your dad's feedback? (laughs) 
<laughs> he still is a very active user and actually involved in the company. I mean, I think one thing a lot of people don't know is that he himself is a technologist. So being visually impaired didn't prevent him from being one of Hong Kong's first blind programmers. Wow, really? That's so interesting. He had ended up doing a lot of research, actually, in Cambridge and in Microsoft, helping build the world's first talking computer in the early 90s. And he has eight patents in text-to-voice technology. And for a period of time, his goal was to enable visually impaired people to be able to use computers. In many ways, I think, eventually you become a multi-product company. But what doesn't change is sort of your values and approach to creating products. For us, we've always been interested in creating products that are meaningful and that are inclusive. I think something that is a bit more subtle and oftentimes is lost is I remember something that my father said that really influenced our design philosophy, which is that what blind people want oftentimes or what visually impaired people want isn't just a function, sometimes just to be normal. Oftentimes, if they have the choice, they would rather not wear their sunglasses. They would rather not use their cane. But the desire is the independence and sameness as everyone else. And that's what the Ori ring does for them, doesn't it? Because they're able to do all of these functions that normally you would do on a screen. That's right. And a lot of these functions that actually we too can use. Ori is a product that is inspired by the visually impaired. So using another really fun way to look at it, we call it like extremophile development, right? By developing something for people that are in the extremities of society, uh, you in fact make something that's easier for everyone to use. So like people like us, I can see, we may not realize it, but we have an over-reliance on screens. We do. We have an over-reliance on our sight, yes. don't we? And sometimes to use conversation or to use audio is a less disruptive and more natural way for using our digital products. Exactly. That's why podcasting is so great. Yes. And you're doing audio now. Yes, awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. What did you study at university? For my undergraduate, I studied political science, so international relations and East Asian studies at New York University. I spent about six years in New York. After graduation, I worked at the Bureau of Immigrant Workers' Rights at the DOL, the Department of Labor. And after a while, I returned to Hong Kong, where eventually I continued my studies, but in business at HKUST, so Hong Kong University of Science and Technology for my MBA, Master's in Business Administration. At this point, did you know that you wanted to be an inventor <laughs> and that you wanted to be at the forefront of technology? It's an interesting question. So I think even though the educational background doesn't necessarily entail my interest in technology, but that has always existed from a very young age. You know, I remember my dad, the very first video games I played, he asked me <laughs> to program myself. Did he? Yes. How yeah. old were you? Maybe six, seven. What? Yeah. So were you doing computer programming at six or yeah, seven? Something like that. Wow, that's amazing. And is that because he was doing it? So he kind of taught you how to do it? That's right. Yeah. And that's really a learning through watching, learning through doing. And it really, I think, piqued my interest in technologies quite strongly. And I guess the reason why I eventually ended up choosing politics is complicated. But, but not because I didn't have a love for science. It was more my desire to want to create an impact, uh, wanting to contribute something to society. That's really cool. And you're doing it in a different yes. way. But I guess you thought you were going to go down the sort of political international relations route. And now you've veered back into your first love of technology. Yeah. And I think, you know, but life works in funny ways. It does. Uh, and really sort of finding something you truly love is oftentimes a meandering, but a very beautiful path. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you feel like you were disadvantaged at all by not studying technology at university when it came to actually beginning your company and starting to create the Ori Ring? Maybe initially, but I think it's fear of the unknown that is probably the greatest killer of innovation. Oh, I love that. That's great. What you need to be able to do is really to willing to get your hands dirty, willing to try. Take a risk, yeah. yeah. And you would be surprised at what you could learn. I think that one thing that both myself and a lot of the early people in our company, we're currently nearly 20 people now, but in sort of the early stages, I remember each one of us was willing to try and to build. And it was this building process that you can learn. You'd be surprised if you spend two months, three months, half a year, a year, how much knowledge you end up accumulating in a given space, even if it is a specialist space. 
And it's something to be said for doing it hands-on, like actually in the workplace rather than through book smarts. You can really learn that way as well, can't you? That's right. It is really a combination of a lot of things. It's Nowadays, we have so much access to information. I mean, it sounds like a joke, but YouTube was my friend. I locked myself out of the house once and broke my key in the lock. So I sat there YouTubing, how do you get a broken key out of the lock? And I got it out and got in my house. Exactly. We started on YouTube. Sometimes there are some great platforms of technologists, builders, hackers on YouTube, and they like to tear things apart. And is that what you were looking at, first of all, just how things work? We started there, just really a curiosity and sort of how similar type products work or how the space works. And then we started buying things ourselves, going to some sort of buying old electronics, old audio equipment and and giving things a try. And Did you know what you wanted to create? Did you already have in your mind that you wanted to create a ring that would do this job or not Definitely really? Definitely not. I would say that we are a company that is technology agnostic. We weren't married to magnetic induction, sort of the base technology behind the actuator at first. Actually, we tried a technology called audio spotlight, sort of like an ultrasonic high frequency sound. We tried electrostatic basically high voltage, low current sound that travels as static over the skin. We tried audio reflection. We tried many different methods. And this was just through initial research or through reading and through consumption of information. There was a lot of very interesting methodologies that were out there. But because our field wasn't specifically in one, we were able to make good decisions about what fits in a consumer product, what makes the most sense, what is the most feasible. Because what we wanted to do was we wanted to bring something into this world. It's very easy to choose a technology. It takes years and decades to build. Uh, you know, it's got a lot of potential, but it's but still... you wanted something that you could create within a few years. Yes, correct. And we wanted that iterative feedback for us to be able to build, show people, improve, and then do it again. And it's not to say that we've written off any of those previous technology that I've said, but it is something that I think allows us to be flexible and to stay agile. How did you find yourself in the startup space? Why did you go into entrepreneurship rather than getting a job, joining a company, getting a weekly wage? That's a huge risk in itself, isn't it? It is. I mean, for me, I think I am a early entrepreneur, but not straight out of school. So I think by the time that I started Origami Labs, the company that makes Ori, I was already 27, which is decently young, I'd say. Yeah, I think that's still pretty young. (laughs) Decently young. Initially, I think after I worked in the States and then I came back to Hong Kong and was helping out with a family business. So I watched manufacturing, retail, OEM, ODM, and was lucky enough to get a lot of responsibility there. Was originally positioned as the third generation successor for that company. And so had a lot of chances to touch many different aspects of business from negotiating to managing people to hiring to to scaling and financing and a lot of these elements. And part of that also gave me the flexibility to explore some of my interests, which was research and development projects as well. When you kind of got started, were you still working in your family company, but also you'd done your business degree as well, which would have really helped. I think there was a transitioning period and family business, you never truly leave family business. And (laughs) so it's sort of an awkward situation now. But I think a lot of that, there's an element of frustration oftentimes, I think, in entrepreneur story. The desire to succeed or the desire to create is often driven by perhaps a lack of something somewhere else. And so for me, I think there are a lot of good things and bad things about family business. But there are a lot of complexities as well in sometimes the inability to get things to move forward or my frustration with my own platform and how to run things. And we were a three-generation family business. As the younger generation, you don't have the final say, I would imagine, wouldn't you? I think so. And not just about say, but I think there's just a lot of deadlock, not a lot of forward movement. Even if I was old enough and I hopefully mature enough to understand that it's not necessarily about listening to me, but hopefully about making some form of forward progress. But sometimes it's frustrating to be a part of a sinking ship that you cannot prevent. Did you feel like you were sinking or just stagnating? Definitely sinking. Oh, really? Wow, bummer. (laughs) Was that part of the impetus that sort of drove you out into your own sort of startup? I think so. The desire to be able to do something that was more productive where I felt that I could contribute something. And between myself and my other founders, who also happened to be involved in family business in some way, ironically. Are you all Hong Kong lads, men? (laughs) Uh, Yes, that's right. Right, okay. 
And so they're all involved in family business and had similar feelings that you did perhaps and wanted to break out. Yeah, something like that. I think it's that desire to break out. And the good thing about the family business background, I think, is that amount of experience that gives you. So it gives you experience beyond your current years. And I think that is very important in a startup. And how many were in your team when you began the startup? We were four. Okay. And I suppose you all brought something different to the table. Yeah. Different backgrounds, different skills, different university degrees and different sort of abilities. That's right. Yeah. We all met at HKUSD for our master's for the MBA, but our backgrounds are all varied. In general, I put myself as the generalist and we had a technologist, the CTO. You called yourself what, sorry? A generalist. A generalist. Is that someone that's just good at everything? Uh, that's just <laughs> someone that is good at nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So you're the generalist yes. and then there's a technologist. Yes. And, a- and then there's an operations specialist right. and marketing and business development. Oh, okay, great. So did you have the easy job then? <laughs> Sometimes I would say my job is the most random for sure. So a day in the office like today. I jump in and out of meetings a lot, but I think my primary job is to make sure we're chasing the right horizon. So oftentimes it's reaching and doing things that don't make sense for today's context. That's so cool. So can you give me an example of how you would be reaching the right horizon or not reaching it? Sure. So for example, let's say in recent weeks, we've been doing a lot of product development for the next version of the product. Of the Ori Ring? Yeah, of the Ori Ring. Okay. I've been trying to discuss with the team and trying to encourage the team to think beyond the current next iteration. It's very easy as a product company to be trapped in this iterative development cycle where each product is just a bit smaller, a bit faster, one feature, new one, two new features. My desire is for Orgami Labs to create a second product that make people gasp and say, ah, this is the product you wanted to create. And you want to jump a couple of steps. You want to get ahead so that you're not going through three stages to get to this amazing product, but getting straight there. That's right. I want people to feel that this first version of the product was really only a stepping stone for the second. And sometimes I think there are, when you're thinking about this as like a painting, you're not painting like separate sections, but trying to sort of unveil a grander vision. So when people see the next product, they should ah, like, ah, like that makes sense. Are you allowed to give me an idea of what you're shooting for? So I would hint that we are interested in private communication in many senses. Right now, we are experts in the delivery of private audio. Our next couple of steps are thinking about in the delivery of private messages. Cool. Have you thought about creating glasses with connected to something like the ring where you can read stuff in front of the glasses or has that been done? I wouldn't put it as, I would say, reading to us is a bit too conventional. Yes, right. Okay, so So you're coming up with something more interesting. Yes, we have. uh, We're thinking about some very interesting things. I think powerful technology is able to reframe everything that you think about. Exactly, because who would have thought that you could touch a ring to your ear and talk to somebody and get answers to questions and communicate? Nobody would have ever even thought that. Yes, yes, and that's only half of the equation. Oh, how exciting. What's been the response of industry and the media and the public to the Ori Ring? It's been fabulous so far. I know we've accumulated about 400 pieces of media coverage, I think in total about four to five million eyeballs on our content, all through zero PR, just grassroots, reaching out to people and people interested in the product. And I think that definitely the media response has been amazing. And we've been very lucky. You've won some awards, haven't you? In startup competitions or technology competition? We've won the Global Elevator World Tour. We were Las Vegas, the CES Consumer Electronics Show, first runner-up for Techstars. This year, we were 2017's top 10 Hong Kong hottest startups. Congratulations. That's incredible. Wow. How long's the Ori Ring been like on the market? Not that long. Just a couple of months. What? All that has happened in a really short space of time. Yeah, basically. Wow. Uh, I think we've been very fortunate. I would say it's there's definitely a degree of luck involved. But I think the team has been really working hard and making sure that we're being put into the best position. I'll say that the core thing about the team is that we've hit even bigger milestones recently. But we have an attitude of sort of always looking forwards and being able to appreciate what's happened behind. So we're not ones to celebrate or to stand still, but to continue 
to pursue that the next objective. Do you have plans to invent or create anything else or are you just focused on development of this technology? We are developing the next two versions of the product, which are in a similar space, but will fundamentally change how you think about communication. What was it like with a father who was visually impaired? Did that sort of inspire you to create technology that could help anybody, no matter what their disability, or were you really just focused on the more visually impaired? Visual impairment was definitely the initial target, but ended up also, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have very crazy methodologies or thinking. I myself am a believer that we don't really create products, we discover products. I think creation is almost a form of human hubris. What we're doing is more like connecting the dots, sort of discovering something, unveiling something. Oftentimes, for example, like our initial target was visual impairment, but ended up also unveiling these tertiary spaces for other types of people as well. Like using the bone conduction technology also happened to be really great for people with audio impairment in that it was able to bypass a lot of ear damage. Is that right? If you have some trouble hearing because of the bone conductivity, you can hear it more internally? Yes, correct. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Correct, yeah. So, I mean, these things, I think, are sometimes it's happenstance, but I think there's a central purpose behind the product that you're trying to create. The bigger picture unveils as you go along, doesn't it? That's like right. you learn more and more about who you are helping with the product as you go along. That's right, yeah. You have to be open to it. Oftentimes, creators or entrepreneurs are too overly laser focused on what they're trying to execute. And you lose sight of all the unopened doors that are around you. That's so interesting. What's your biggest market for the ring at the moment? Who's buying it? We recently launched our crowdfunding campaign towards the end of last year. We launched Hong Kong's second largest crowdfunding campaign all time. Did you? Yeah, which sounds really amazing, but it's not as big as most people think. Oh, okay. Uh, And what was that funding for? Is basically you can call them pre-sales. Oh, okay. uh, They're all pre-orders for people that are interested in the product and want to support in the mass manufacturing process of the product. So we sold about 5,000 rings there Wow! in a span of a couple of months, which is pretty good. That's great. Yeah. So our first manufacturing order has basically been completely fulfilled. And now we're gearing up for the next couple of orders. So it should be on target for anywhere between 15 to 25,000 by the end of the year. Wow. Congratulations. You guys are doing amazingly. You mentioned the screen-free revolution, and what do you think that means for the future of technology? This is one of those things where I was talking about how we really didn't know what we were part of. I think oftentimes your mind sort of pulls some spark from movements all across the world. Maybe it's just subconsciously you're thinking about them, but two or three years ago when we were talking about screen-free revolution, it didn't make any sense. But today, this is one of the hottest topics in Silicon Valley and and the U.S. If you're looking at all of the major electronic companies this year, whether it's Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, they're all producing screen-free products, voice artificial intelligence. This is the movement forward. They know that from a screen's perspective, increased clarity, increased speed is no longer as beneficial to the user as before. The app ecosystem has already become a very commoditized industry. And the next steps are really in the personalization and the conversational elements of our interaction with digital products. That's so interesting because the app space and the screen space is really oversaturated now, isn't it? Yes, yes. To diversify into this screen-free revolution puts you ahead of the game. But then it's like, are we going to do without our iPhones, are we? They're going to go. No, no. iPhones will definitely still be around. Okay. But you can think about it this way, I think. I was recently meeting with Google in the US. And the way to describe it is really good, which is we primarily use conversation day to day. You know, our phones are super important products, but they really only take up a very small portion of our lives. The way we absorb information is much, much more diverse than that. That's so true. The entertainment media is the best way to be able to see this. You have like movies like Jarvis in Iron Man or Her or, you know, all these cutting edge technology that are almost trying to project the future or where we're going to be going. They may not be iterated or appear in the same way they are in these media. But we're definitely going in a direction where I think the way in which we interact with these assistants is starting to change. Like a great example, I think, is 
recently the Google I/O conference it created a lot of controversy. And why is that? It was a you can ask the assistant to help you make an appointment, and then the assistant will call a venue for you on your behalf and speak to that person in conversation. So, for example, if you wanted to book a haircutting appointment, you tell Google Assistant you want to do it. Then Google Assistant will call the hair appointment person and then speak to that hair appointment person as if it were a real person, and then make the booking for you and then respond back to you. How interesting! So it's like bots doing the job for you. Yes, that's right. Or just like a true assistant, like a personal assistant. Ah, but it's all technology. Yes, it's a bit scary. It is. That brings me to my next question, which is: What do you think the future of artificial intelligence is, and how is that going to impact society? Like, I know that from a teaching standpoint, we are thinking that it's going to be harder for kids to get jobs. That they're going to be pushed more into this startup space and this entrepreneurial space. And that life is perhaps going to be more difficult. What's your take on it? I've heard many different takes. It's really hard to predict where things are going to go, and definitely do think that we are very far off from artificial intelligence taking up a majority of our creative roles. I would say we are pretty close to replacing a lot of more traditional roles. So I think maybe we're three or four years off from artificial intelligence, or artificial intelligence is not. Accurate term, maybe like enhanced intelligence, is probably going to take over accounting, maybe some legal, some sciences,、um, some cal- definitely heavy calculation-based things. Repetitive, task-oriented jobs will definitely be streamlined. I'd say there would still be people involved, but much less than before because the bots are going to be doing most of the work. Like a lot of top traders today, they are actually using bots to do a lot of the trading in the first place. Are they? And things are already happening in that direction. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. But I would say that that's not necessarily a bad thing. So if we think about politics, if we think about history, we're not complaining that we're not farming. There are less farmers, right? We're not complaining that we miss the farmer lifestyle because eventually people transition to doing other things. In the same way that at first, when we're losing factory jobs, today we're not complaining that we're lacking a factory jobs. Just like you were saying with the technology, that there's stuff coming that we haven't even thought of.、Yeah. There are jobs coming that we haven't even thought of as well, aren't there? So my general thinking is that as humans, we will eventually find something to do, and those things will be shifting to more creative elements. And what those creative elements are, I'm not sure, but I think it can be a very powerful thing. I know myself. Other than science, I love music and I love art. If there are more people that do those things, that can be a very powerful and very human thing to do as well. So good for well-being and mindfulness and mental health and things like that. And I think moving into the creativity space is a good thing for young people to think of. And also the jobs where you have to have that personal connection, where you've got to have some sort of connection with somebody and be inspired or be advised or that sort of thing. That's where the jobs will be, won't they? Right. And I think the more complex element is if you move even further forward. The debate oftentimes, you know, that the people like Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, the points that they are trying to fight about is what they call general intelligence, which is the point where an artificial intelligence becomes more intelligent than a human being. Is this going to happen? There's a lot of debate on that because they can't program emotion, though. Isn't that the problem? Isn't that where they're going to be lacking? They won't have that ability to have emotion. I think a lot of these are still very hypothetical, so I can't say if I said something like artificial intelligence is going to learn itself or teach itself. I mean, these are just yeah, hypothetical only, things. Only time will tell. So I don't really know.、Yeah. I don't know even how technically it should be achieved. Can you just explain to me what does general intelligence mean then? Yeah, it's sort of a convergence point where, as artificial intelligence is a theory, and sort of as artificial intelligence continues to improve on many different aspects, it starts to gain some form of consciousness, and then it starts to learn more. And then once it surpasses a certain point, then it becomes a general intelligence, something that is all-encompassing, that has the intelligence of a human being, but has the ability to action. At a global level, that's so interesting.、Yes. Wow, I've never heard of that.、Yeah. That's very cool. Wow, I've read that you say you believe in disruptive technology for the greater good. Can you explain what that means? You want to be able to create technology that has impact. So we talked a bit about this at the beginning, which is 
there are many different types of entrepreneurs, but I think for me, I want to be a type of entrepreneur that contributes to basically our field of knowledge. So if you take that one step further, there are two types of things that you can do to the sphere. There's something you can do to crack it, and there's something that you can do to grow it. And I think if you can contribute something to this world, then hopefully it's something that's good. And that helps to grow it. Yes, that's right. I think that's what we mean by trying to create disruptive technology that benefits people. So at its first glance, it may seem that it's not encroaching on something, it's creating a new category. That's sort of our general approach. So a good example of that would be like the smartphone. You know, when the iPhone first came out, it was not unique. There are no unique pieces of technology within it. But combined a lot of different pieces of technology, you know, from capacitor touch from Motorola to the operating system and app structure of Palm Pilot to overall form factor from some previous products. And there are obviously unique elements to it and good design and they combine all of these things. But combined, it produced something that was a new need for us. Before then, you would never say that you needed a smartphone. No, but now 80% of the world all have a smartphone. I made that (laughs) statistic up, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) But now a lot of us do. And it's definitely disruptive. You know, it's changed our habits as people. In so many ways. And it's changed how teenagers grow up. It's changed so many things, how we connect with the world, our understanding of what's going on in the world. It's made it more of a global world, hasn't it? Yes, yes. But it's definitely made us more connected than before. Yes. Does your ring have old technology that you've adapted or does it have completely new technology that you've invented? I would say it has old technology that we've improved. And I think it's our belief that in most pieces of technology or most products, there really is no such thing as completely new technology. It's very, very, very rare. And if it is, it's oftentimes very far from an executional level. So the reason why we're Origami Labs, because we believe that technology should be treated like a piece of paper where it's simple, but it's about how you fold together that becomes the end product. It's really cool. That's great. Did you come up with that name? How did we come up with it? I don't remember. That's okay, but it's really cool. You mentioned earlier that you won Asia's first elevator world tour. Yes. Is that where you have to do an elevator pitch about what you are creating? So you've got 30 seconds to a minute. Are you literally in an elevator? Yeah, we were in the ICC in Hong Kong. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. From the zero to... I guess it's a hundred something, a hundred floor. Yeah, it's the tallest building in the world, isn't it, the ICC? Or is it the second tallest building in the world? I think it's the first. One of the tallest, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the first or second tallest building in the world. And so you went up in the lift. Yeah, and then it's supposed to be 60 seconds, but it's 63 seconds. Okay, so you had 63 seconds to pitch about your ring. Correct. And who were you pitching to? It was two investors. Okay, fantastic. And how many people pitched? In total, there were, I think, about 400 companies that applied, 100 companies that pitched on that day, and then another 10 finalists that were chosen, and then a final three, and then one winner. And then you won that? Yes, luckily. Congratulations. That's amazing. And what does that mean for you and your company? I think it's good awareness. There's always a combination of validation. I would say my word of caution is that competitions and awards are important, but they are not what define you as a company. To chase public recognition, I think, is a very dangerous vice that a lot of startups get trapped into. Why is that? Is because you get hooked on that rather than the quality of your product? Correct, yeah, because it's easy to talk the talk, but you also have to walk the walk. And then your product will speak for itself. Correct, yes. See, this is all good advice for me regarding this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Make it good. (laughs) What advice would you give to anybody wanting to work in the tech startup space? I would say first, try to think about if you are suitable for the space first. So specifically for the startup space, I think... What makes someone suitable? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I think oftentimes I try to frame it as what makes you not suitable. So sometimes it's hard to look at the mirror and to say to yourself, that, hey, maybe I'm not necessarily built for startups now. The startup environment is a very harsh environment and it's a beautiful thing. It's a very powerful thing, but it is also very draining, very time consuming and extremely intensive. 
And so it is a very much sort of trial by fire experience that is not built for everyone. So I think it's very important for young people to know or old people to know exactly what they're getting into. What characteristics would you need to have or not have? Yeah. Like resilience and dedication and being able to be flexible and not be stuck in the nine to five. I would try not to stick with qualities that are positive. Like resilience is always a positive thing, right? But for example, one thing that I think is more contentious is, for example, how do you learn as a person? Do you like to learn in a way that is controlled, right? That is predictable, that is predictable where things, where people tell you, and that is the best way in which you absorb things, which is a good thing in many situations, right? Or are you the type of person that likes to learn as you go, right? That you learn on the job, right? And you don't mind when people don't tell you things and you're able to go out and sort of make mistakes. And these are two very different type of people. So different. And the second one is the one for the startup space, not the first. Right. But I would be cautious to say that one is better than the other, right? It just is very dependent on the kind of environment that you're in. So it's really just about sort of looking in the mirror and asking, okay, So what kind of learner am I? I think another very important aspect is how you deal with risk. And the analogy I use is like you're standing on a diving board. No matter what, you can stand there for half a day, but you have to be the person that when you jump, you are well committed to your jump. You don't shrink back. You can take that step forward. There's many different types of people. Like if you're the type of person that stands up there, looks down, No matter what, you could be nervous, but then you take a deep breath and you jump immediately. Maybe you're a founder. Maybe you're the first person in the company. If you're the person that stands up there, your legs are trembling, you sort of, you squat there for a bit, but after a lot of deliberation, you jump. Maybe you're a great first employee, right? Maybe you're a great first hire. But if you're the person that you'll stand there, but you're indecisive, then maybe you're not the right type of person. So it depends on what kind of person you are and how you evaluate risk. Because ultimately, I think joining a startup or entering the space is such an illogical decision. The statistics will tell you that 95% of startups fail by a third year. Is it? Wow. Or something like that. Did you know that going into it? Yes. You're willing to take that risk. Yes. But it's about having the confidence to be able to beat the odds and having a plan on how to do it. How long have you been running your startup in total? This is our third year. Wow, you've achieved amazing stuff in three years. That's yeah. unbelievable. Oh, my God, you guys are whiz kids. Yeah. <laughs> wow, congratulations. Thank That's you. amazing. Are you really invested in wearable technology as well? Yes. I'm a big believer in understanding our space. So all wearable tech, I'm always paying attention. Just to finish up, what are the areas or skills that you would like to develop in yourself? Oftentimes when people ask me what I fear the most for our company, I fear that I will not be able to reinvent myself. Why is that necessary? Because a company enters many different stages in its life. Oftentimes, what made us successful in our first two years or first three years, maybe what kills us in the next three. And I don't want to be the person that will steer us down the wrong path. So I think, for example, when we started, I think there was a lot of aspects in terms of determination, getting my hands dirty, sort of being a naysayer, there's a sort of like fighting the element to what you're doing, because maybe a lot of people don't necessarily believe in what you do. But as you transition, things start to change to be a bridge builder instead of a bridge burner. You need to create strong partnerships. So for example, a lot of my work today involves traveling, involves setting up relationships, involves setting up things that may be beneficial for us in the future. Maybe a lot of these things don't come to me is not my second nature. Maybe my second nature is to think of product, to think of future elements. And I really like that, that technologist element of my job. And I'm not abandoning it, but you've got to diversify. Yes. Yes. I now must be a more sort of diverse and powerful version of myself that I wasn't before or my one trackness was a strength, but now that can become a weakness. Yes, because your company is expanding before your eyeballs like so fast. So you've got to keep up, don't you? And it's the simple things like I need to be really good at welcoming new employees. Just something that I need to do. And it's not always easy. And especially for someone like me, like, for example, we have very strong company culture that has been built because of the people that we have. But now as we're expanding to 20 and 20 beyond, some of the things are harder to control. 
And now I have to introduce elements into the company that maybe I used to not be as comfortable with. Some form of a little bit more formal structure, right? Some things need to be codified. There are always these contradicting elements into the things that you need to do. And we need to learn how to adapt yet not be able to forget who we are. Oh, I love that too. Kevin, if people want to learn more about the Ori Ring or get in touch with you in some way to congratulate you or find out more about what you're doing or try to work for you or try to learn from you, how can they do that? If they want to contact me, they can send me a message or email me at Kevin, K-E-V-I-N at origami-labs.com. And I think even till today, we do keep a lot of personal touch and communications. I get a lot of emails, but try to get to every single one. So I'd be happy to chat over a coffee or anything, especially if you're a student or if you're someone that's interested in the space. You guys are definitely the future. And a lot of why we like to do talks like this or to do podcasts like this or interviews like this is because we believe our greatest job is to show people that there's a path and for the next generation to be more successful than us. And there's a phrase I like a lot, which is, it's not about you, it's about those that come before you and those that come after. And really, our greatest job is enable to make sure that someone fears this path a little bit less. You've been doing talks in schools. You get out there and you really do your bit for the community. And I think it's great for young people and for their parents to see that the startup space and going into entrepreneurship really can be a viable way forward for a career. You know, my generation really feels like you've got to get a job, got to have your health cover, you've got to have your regular wage. And that's how we grew up. But things are shifting and changing massively, aren't they? I would say that the biggest thing is to understand that this path is not set. So, you know, choosing the startup route doesn't mean that you've closed all your other doors. You know, choosing the corporate route doesn't mean that you've closed the door on joining a startup. It's really about making the best of your experiences. Pride yourself in being someone that can learn in any environment. And I respect the people that can learn the most from negative things. That's brilliant as well, because we can learn so much more from our failures or from things that go wrong than our successes. And that's something that's very important for people to understand. Right. Even if you make the wrong choice, even if you end up joining the wrong startup, or if you're a young person who has started a company, has hired people, has had to fire people, has raised a little bit of money, has wasted that money. This is an amazing person. And by the time you finish with this experience and you've truly learned from it, you could go anywhere from starting your own company again to joining a corporate. People would be begging you to join them. Because of your experience. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. Kevin, thank you so much for meeting me today. I've learned so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. And thank you for your time. I know you're super busy. You've just flown in. You're probably flying out tonight. (laughs) And uh, it's wonderful to talk to you about your startup, entrepreneurship, your Ori Ring, and the amazing strides you've been making in the technology world so fast. I'm so proud of you. And it's an honor to meet you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Javier with Pretend Radio. And this season... I'm embedding myself in a cult. Throw him to the ground and get his devils out! Forgive us, Jesus! Forgive us, Jesus! Families will turn on each other. Let me make it really clear. I am Jamie's mother, but what he says is lies. Babies will be ripped away from their parents. It's hurtful to see them and know that their lives could have been much different in a, in a home outside of there. We're not letting go of so well with each other. And the powerful, well, they'll be held accountable. Um, as a district attorney, it's probably better for me not to comment. <laughs> why is that? Why is that? Survivors are not holding back, and the church is not backing down. Many in the media have tried to get in front of the accused cult leader, Jane Whaley, and have failed. We have asked you to leave. But somehow, I got in. How are you, sir? Yeah, Yeah, um, I'm here to speak with Jane Whaley. She invited me to service today. Yeah. This season, we're going deeper into the Word of Faith Fellowship than ever before. This story is on a collision course. And it's not going to end well. Why would anybody want to harm him? Sometimes we hurt other people by hurting people they love. Pretend Radio, Season 3, The Prophet. What's the matter with us? We're not going to burn God's will! Right. 
So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me, and I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details.